So in part one we dealt with is the climate changing? Is, it, is the globe warming? And in part two we're going to look at climate change impacts. This is the longer portion of this lecture slash mini course. So where are we now? 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming. That's how much warming we've had so far. And the impact. So now we're going to look at the impact of this amount of warming. It doesn't seem like much, but as we'll see, it has a big impact. Climate change is forecasted. So scientists have forecasted that climate change would melt mountain glaciers that feed the Earth's rivers. It would melt the great ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Melt the summer ice in the Arctic, cause more destructive storms, increase the area affected by drought, cause more frequent and destructive wildfires, and reduce crop yields. And as we will see, 0.8 degrees Celsius warming is already, is already doing this. We saw the Portage Glacier, melting glaciers. Here's an image from a NASA image of Greenland ice melt. So it's melting Greenland. Greenland, if Greenland melts, it would take a long time for Greenland to melt. Greenland would add 23 feet in sea level rise. Here is an image of the Arctic sea ice, the extent of it. So we see the 1979, the minimum was all the way around here, the Arctic sea ice minimum, the average between 1979 and 2006, and here is the sea ice minimum 2007. So that's the extent of the ice in the Arctic. An even more important issue, factor, is the volume, that is how thick is the ice. And here we can see, here we can see how it's just crashing. That is, the volume is, is decreasing very rapidly. And this is quite alarming for scientists. Mark Cerisi, uh, director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center in the U.S. in 2008, after the massive decline in 2007, maintained that the Arctic sea ice is in a death spiral. In 2010, we've had this past year another uh, great drop in the volume of sea ice and the, uh, the extent of sea ice. And he said, I stand by my previous statements that the Arctic summer sea ice cover is in a death spiral. It's not going to recover. So the Arctic is estimated to be free of ice in the summer sometime between 2016 and 2030. This is a major, this will have major influence on world climate, global climate. And this, the Arctic has not been free of ice in the summers for thousands of years. Jace Wally at NASA had this to say in 2007. The Arctic is often cited as the canary in the coal mine for climate warning. Now as a sign of climate warning, the canary has died. It's time to start getting out of the coal mines. And the Arctic will do all, lots of things we don't, the, the, the basically scientists said that when the Arctic uh, sea ice diminishes, that this will have enormous effects on the weather around the world. And we've already be, begun to see that. Uh, this is called the Arctic Paradox. And what, I, what Tom Friedman of the New York Times likes to call global warming, not global warming, but global weirding. That is that the stable climate that we're used to is changing. So, oddly, this paradox, the, the loss of Arctic sea ice, changes atmospheric pressure and winds, and potentially results in more severe winter storms in the eastern U.S. and in Eurasia. So the actual the melting of the Arctic uh, creates bigger storms in the Northeast. Now, people in the Northeast say, oh, when a big storm comes, oh, there's no global warming, and the scientists are actually been saying in several studies, that when the Arctic melts, it's going to uh, cause this. 
So one scientist uh, maintained that it was like leaving the refrigerator door open when the Arctic sea ice diminishes. It's like le uh, leaving the refrigerator door open. It's warm inside the refrigerator, but it gets cold in the room around it. Similarly, it's warm in the Arctic, but in the area around it, it gets cold. The cold air is pushed down. We saw uh, some of this global weirding, weirding um, in February 2011 with a massive 30-state snowstorm. This is an image from NASA. So it's important also to know that, that as the planet warms, we saw this earlier, more moisture is in the atmosphere, more moisture, the scientists estimate that a 7% increase in the moisture of the atmosphere for every degree Celsius of warming, and that bit of moisture will make more extreme storms. In, in the summer, you'll have more extreme rains, and in winter, you're going to have more extreme snows, which we've had this past year. The winters of 2010, 2011, 2009, and 2010, along with 1960 and 1961, have had the most major snowstorms in the Northeast. Now, interestingly, 2010 is the warmest year, tied with 2005 is the warmest year in the climate record. While the winter of 2009 to 2010 brought record snowstorms to the Europe and the U.S., East Coast, and the coldest temperatures in 25 years, Canada and much of the Arctic experienced the warmest winter on record. 2005 and 2010 are the warmest years in the temperature record. In 2010, 19 nations, a record number, set temperature records. So 2005, warmest year on record. We scientists maintain that as we warm the globe, we'll have more destructive hurricanes, like Hurricane Katrina in August 2005. Here's the aftermath of Katrina. 13,000 people were killed by, by Katrina. Uh, there was $200 billion in damages. And by 2011, still 30% of the population was reduced. I think at the time that uh, a million people had to leave New Orleans. This is Nashville's flooding, what some people call Nashville's Katrina in May 2010. It was a one in a thousand year rain event. This is an image of Nashville's largest and most celebrated hotel, the Osprey Hotel. And it's flooded 10 feet in the main room of the Osprey Hotel. Pakistan flooding in July 2010. In five days, Pakistan experienced 16.4 feet of rain in the northwest of Pakistan. So in five days. The Northwest normally receives uh, 20 inches of rain in the month of July. Over a five-day period, it experienced 16 and a half feet. Here are some NASA images of the Indus River at the beginning of this rainstorm, right before the flood. You can see the Indus River there. You can see Kashmir, the city. Kowali here, and this is after the flooding. Kowali's under water, it's flooded all the countryside. Pretty incredible. Here is an aerial view of the area affected, an aerial view of an area affected by the floods on the outskirts of Multan. We see that it's simply devastated. The Pakistani flood killed 1,600 people and created 16 million homeless and hungry. Two million homes were damaged or destroyed. Some six million acres of crops were damaged or destroyed. Over one million livestock were drowned. Then in Australia, in 2011, okay, Australia's summer, 
Intense rainfall caused flooding of an area the size of Germany and France combined and affected 200,000 people in 20 towns and cities in Queensland, Australia. Here is Australia's third largest city, Brisbane. Brisbane has two million people in it. You can see that the downtown is completely flooded. Here is Rock, uh, city Rockhampton, uh, has, a, has roughly around 100,000 people, and we can see how it's completely flooded. So this is not simply affecting the third world, it's affecting the developed world. The Moscow heat wave, from late June to mid-August 2010, according to The Guardian, which is a uh, English newspaper, an excellent one, I would recommend it for environmental issues. The rec according to The Guardian, the Russian Meteorological Center reported there was nothing similar to this on the territory of Russia during the last thousand years in regard to heat. The average temperature in Moscow, okay, not Moscow is uh, very far north latitude, the average temperature in Moscow for July was 14 degrees Fahrenheit above the norm. This led to thousands of fires that led to $300 billion of damage. Lester Brown at the Earth Policy Institute reports that over 56,000 people died in the extreme heat. And this is the image, a NASA image, of smoke covering Moscow and the environs, and the environs from forest fires that resulted from these record high temperatures. And the latitude of Moscow is 55 degrees north. Here's an image of a wedding in Moscow. And then these heat waves are a problem for global food security. According to Lester Brown at the Earth Policy Institute, who's an expert on um, global food security, Russia's grain harvest shrank from nearly 100 million tons to scarcely 60 million tons as crops withered. So 40% reduction of Russia's wheat uh, grain harvest. Recently, the world's number three world wheat exporter, Russia banned grain exports in a desperate move to rein in soaring domestic food prices. Between mid-June, because of this, between mid-June and mid-August, the world price of wheat climbed 60%. So a 40% reduction in uh, the third largest wheat exporter, Russia, caused the world price of wheat to climb 60%. China is now in the middle of a terrible drought. East China's Shandong province, one of the country's major grain producers, has experienced the worst drought in 200 years. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization issued a special alert in February 2011 about major potential shortfalls in China's wheat crop and the resultant price shocks that could be felt around the globe. China accounts for one-sixth of the world's wheat. According to the UN, one-third of China's wheat production has been affected by the drought. In addition, 2.57 million people and nearly 2.8 million head of livestock faced shortages of drinking water. And this food and these, uh, this disruption, this climate disruption from flooding and from heat waves has been an important factor in political stability around the world. John Ashton and many others, so John Ashton is the British Foreign Secretary's uh, Special Representative for Climate Change, and many others have maintained this, said that high food prices brought about climate change, brought about by climate change, have helped fuel the current unrest in the Middle East. So part of the unrest in Tunisia and in Egypt uh, was brought about by high food prices, brought about by the flooding in Australia, flooding in Canada, the flooding in Pakistan, the heat waves in Russia. The price of wheat has gone up 80% over the past year. 
Government subsidies and ration cards in Egypt have limited that price surge to 30%. And 40% of, of Egyptians' income goes to food. And this is true of, of poor countries. And as of February, or the February of 2011, many of the countries in the Middle East were stocking up on wheat supplies, so they start to hoard grains. So in order to feed uh, your population. And to, in the words of David Biello, to avoid regime, regime change. At this point, the time I'm taping this, uh, Egypt uh, has a deposed Hosni Mubarak, with a dictator of 30 years. Climate change leads to political instability. It also leads to war. When people can't feed themselves, they'll fight the resources. Darfur is an example of this. Arab herders and African farmers lived in relative peace until the droughts came. Now 300 people have died in the conflict in Darfur. Though it is still an open question, climate models show that climate change was responsible for disrupting the African monsoons. Darfur may be the first climate war. Climate change is also presently destroying our great forests. This is an image from the Amazon rainforest. And this is one of the more disturbing studies that I've seen on the climate issue. The Amazon rainforest has suffered. This is a study, uh, a recent study has been put out by Simon Lewis on the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest has suffered an extreme drought that usually only happens every 100 years. But it's happened in 2005, the warmest year on record, and 2010, the two warmest years on record. So you've had in 2005 and 2010 a one in a hundred year, hundred year event. Millions of trees have died, and these trees will release the carbon they have stored for over 300 years. Remember, trees absorb carbon dioxide. And when they die, they will release, they decompose, they will release that carbon. So the carbon in these trees that they've stored for 300 years will be released. The two droughts will end up adding an estimated 13 billion tons of additional CO2 into the atmosphere. This is equal to the combined emissions of 2009 from China and the U.S., the two biggest emitters in the world. So the, the death of these trees in the Amazon is what's called, climate scientists call, a positive feedback or an amplifying feedback. That is, that you, uh, 2005, 2010, warmest years on records, you have this warming, it creates uh, the death of these millions of these trees, and the, these trees will release CO2, greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere on the scale of the emission of China in the U.S. It's on a huge scale. We'll release that CO2 in the atmosphere, that CO2 in atmosphere will cause additional warming, which will call, cause more trees to die in the Amazon, which will increase more warming. It's what they, scientists call it a positive feedback. It increases the warming. We would call it, in lay language, a vicious cycle. The author, Simon Lewis, of the study said this, two unusual and extreme droughts occurring within a decade may largely offset the carbon absorbed by intact Amazon rainforests during that time. If events like this happen more often, the Amazon rainforest will reach a point where it shifts from being a valuable carbon sink, that is absorbing a lot of CO2, slowing climate change to a major source of greenhouse gases that could speed it up. Having two events of this magnitude in such close succession is extremely unusual, but it is unfortunately consistent with those climate models that project a grim future for Amazonia. But it's not only in, an Am in the Amazon, this is also happening in a different way in the great forests of North America. This is a picture of, of north of Breckenridge, and we see the, the green, healthy pine trees, and then we see all these dead pine trees. And the pine trees are dying because of what's called the pine bark beetle. The winters are not cold enough to kill off the beetle. 
the trees are also stressed from uh, drought, and the pine park bark beetle is is uh, destroying uh, great swaths of the western United States and British Columbia. And indeed, in the western U.S., the pine bark beetle has destroyed 6.5 million acres of forest. In British Columbia, the pine bark beetles destroyed, as of 2009, 35 million acres. That is two times the size of Ireland. So 35 million acres of forest, two times the size of Ireland. And this is another positive feedback. It's also important to recognize that the boreal forests of Canada and Russia, so the British Columbia, the, the, the forest there is the boreal forests, hold much more carbon than other forests in the world. So as the planet heats up, pine bark beetle infestation gets worse, more trees die, releasing more carbon, etc. A vicious circle, a positive feedback. And this probably is the most troubling study of the past year. And this one is about our, that presently we're destroying the base of the ocean food chain. This article in the journal Nature shows that there's been a 40% decline in ocean phytoplankton since 1950. And this is linked to the rise in ocean surface temperatures. So a 40% decline in phytoplankton. According to the lead author, biologist Boris Warren, quote, phytoplankton are a critical part of our planetary life support system. They produce half of the oxygen we breathe, draw down surface CO2, and ultimately support all our fishes. So it, the, the phytoplankton also absorb, absorb CO2 as you kill the phytoplankton. If the phytoplankton die off, less CO2 to absorb, etc. Another vicious cycle. The author says, if this holds up, something really serious is underway and has been underway for decades. I've been trying to think of a biological change that's bigger than this, and I can't think of one. Input.